mobile hunters, are you looking to make the move to saddle hunting this year? Or maybe you just want to add a few new pieces of gear or upgrade your current saddle gear. If that's the case, then head over to tetherednation.com where they've got all mobile hunters covered. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old timer, Tethered is your one-stop saddle shop. From saddles to ropes, sticks, ascenders, whatever it is you need, they have you covered. I've personally been using their gear for the past three seasons. Now, my base setup consists of the Phantom Saddle and the Predator Platform. And if you're wondering why I've chosen to use their gear above all else, here's the cliff notes. They're innovative and pushing the mobile hunting forward overall. They cut no corners and prioritize the safety and performance of their gear. They care about the community that they've created, and their gear allows me to hunt free. And above all else, I like to support good people doing good work. If you're interested in upping your mobile hunting game, then head to tetherednation.com. This podcast is brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. Skull Brew Coffee roasts premium single origin coffee guaranteed to deliver the freshest coffee directly to your doorstep. The kicker, they're 2% for conservation certified and donate 10% of their proceeds back to organizations who support the interests of our hunting community. So go to SkullBrewCoffee.com and pick up one of their three killer roasts and fuel your hunt and fill more tags with Skull Brew Coffee. Welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 227. Today, we're rolling into part number two of my conversation with Nathan Keelan, and we're talking about hunting mature mountain bucks of the Appalachian Mountains. So stay tuned. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. We are going to keep this up front pretty short today. Actually, truth be told, I usually, I think I've mentioned, I've mentioned this probably a hundred times in, in the podcast, but I usually do all my kind of editing, recording on Sundays uh, after a weekend of usually outdoor activity, et cetera, give you guys a quick update of what's shaking. But Unfortunately, I got a bunch of stuff going on this weekend, and so I had to kind of cram this, uh, get this edit in. Uh, earlier in the week because if you guys didn't know this is a complete one-man show i am i am i am it i am the host the recorder the producer the editor the janitor of truth from the stands <laughs> janitor might be my most uh illustrious title of the uh, of the truth from the stand business so actually i'm going to refer to myself as the truth from the stand janitor from now on i think that's probably more more appropriate but anyway uh had to get this in early uh since i have a busy weekend coming up that i'm going to have a uh, be preoccupied and wanted to make sure i had a podcast to launch for uh for you guys the one bit of news that i will pass along is that you know, as you guys know, I've been kind of scouting some some new areas and stuff like that, and got some some good intel um, recently that I'm kind of in the right in the right in the right area. You know, did a little did a little learning, did a little um, investigating, and had some some folks share some information with me for, with a, about a couple spots, just to kind of I guess more so um, qualify the sign that I'm seeing more so than anything. Um, because I was kind of trying to went into the new piece that I wasn't hundred percent sure about. I was seeing some sign, but wasn't sure if it was significant or not, you know, wasn't sure how big it, big the sign should be. And wasn't quite sure of the deer density and stuff like that in this particular area. And so I got a little bit of Intel and I feel a lot better about some of the information I have. And I feel like I'm, I'm kind of skirting maybe around the edge of being, being in the right, uh, being in the game, so to speak. So I think we'll, you know, time will tell, of course, and uh, it's, it's, you know, we'll do a couple turnarounds here, man, and, and, and Velvet Fest will be upon us that our, our boys from Exodus run. So I have to get out and put up a couple trail cameras uh, to kind of monitor a couple of these spots, and hopefully I'll be able to do that over the course of turkey season. Um, and then, you know, of course, the PA has the turkey opener here in the not-so-distant future, and I'll be actually headed back to the family camp, the family farm do a little hunting with them. I think I'm going to take my buddy Wilson with me uh, back there to, so he can get a hunt in on the farm. There's always birds, uh, always birds killed usually the opening day on, on that piece of property. And it's always, I always miss deer camp uh, back there just because I don't, I don't gun hunt much anymore and I don't really take much time off for it. And usually that, that time over the Thanksgiving, I try to spend with uh, my wife and my daughter and stuff like that. Since I usually have just gotten back from whatever trip I was doing you know, in the Midwest or whatever, whatever the case is. So, um, I've usually just been back for about a week. So it's not like I can just dip and ditch everyone to, to go hunt again. So I usually miss deer camp 
back home these days. And so what I started thinking of doing starting this year was starting to do a turkey camp with the family, uh, with my father-in-law and Tate. So hopefully we'll have a podcast coming up with, with our old friend, uh, with our old friend Tate, which would be kind of cool. Uh, but doing that over the opener, which I'm pretty stoked about because I haven't been back home. I haven't been back to the farm in a, in a, in a long while. I haven't hunted the farm in a long while. So it'll be nice to get back and do a little, a little turkey hunting back there with my, with my buddy Wilson. And I'm not sure how we're going to break this up. I think, I think he might be doing the calling since he's a better caller than I am. And I think we're just going to do some hunting in the morning and then, uh, maybe a little trout fishing in the evening or some golf or something. It's going to be basically a dude weekend. So with that, a couple quick things, some housekeeping before we jump into the podcast. One, you can still head over to, to skullbrewcoffee.com. Use the promo code truth, get yourself uh, some savings here during Earth Month, if you will. So make sure you're taking advantage of that. A couple killer roasts, some uh, single pack pour overs for those of you that like that are on the go, traveling, hunting, fishing, camping, whatever the case is. We got you don't have to have that shitty instant coffee. You can have some good Skull Brew coffee. So head over to SkullBrewCoffee.com and check that out. Use the promo code Truth, and then also head to TruthfulMistand.com. Head to the merch page if you're interested in merch. Got T-shirts, sweatshirts, phone cases, and things of the like if you so desire. So with that. We're jumping into part number two of the conversation with Nathan Keelan. Nathan, of course, is from Virginia, hunting mountain bucks, kills giants, oftentimes with trad equipment, does some black powder hunting. If you didn't listen to part one uh, two weeks ago, I'd go back and listen to that. But what we dive into more specifically is is uh, in this session is, you know, something that I'm having to get better at. One is hunting off of big sign, like big sign. You will want to suck right up close to that and try to hunt it. And he really kind of makes his living hunting off of big sign. So we talk about really like his setups and how he hunts off of big sign, like allows it to use it to help him understand what's in the area and what's going on. But he doesn't necessarily hunt, you know, um, right over it necessarily. And with that, what we kind of roll into then is really kind of talking about terrain features kind of converging and coming together and kind of tying multiple ridge systems and multiple kind of. Uh, topographical things kind of together, which are really kind of the linchpin to for dynamite killing spots. Whenever you're talking about talking about big woods, and we also talk a little bit about lines of movement and secondary ridges and how those all kind of play a role in his overall hunting strategy for hunting hunting mountain bucks in the uh, Appalachian Mountains. So, with that, we're going to go ahead and jump into the podcast. As always, want to thank you all for listening. I wanted to ask, man, do you think as we were talking about like lighter sign, you know? some of these deer, you know, their personalities and stuff like that. Do you feel like as deer get older, they start to lay down less sign, like just generally speaking, or do you think it's always kind of strictly kind of tied to their personality? Uh, I think it's uh, tied to their personality because I've, I've hunted some bucks that, uh, you know, just did not leave much sign at all. And they was almost like ghosts and you just had to, you know, uh, just trust that they were still there, you know, (laughs) and uh, eventually you'd have opportunity at them. And then there's been other bucks that I've hunted that has just tore the woods up, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I think that it just goes back to personality. You know, deer are so much like humans uh, as far as personalities and even body size and type, you know, uh, way more than what uh, most hunters probably think that they do. So Right, right. It's just like humans, you know, you have some that's a lot more aggressive than others. and Right. You know. Yeah. I mean, I think I want to shift gears here a minute and, I want to start talking about your setups and like how you're kind of picking where you're going to set up. Because I I think for some people out there listening, like when they hear, when they, when they're hearing us talking about not setting up on the hot sign, I think all the conventional wisdom, probably what they've read in media, what they've watched in media and stuff like that is you set up on, on the sign, right? And here we are talking about, you know, trying to find like the outskirts of that sign and where you can, you know, possibly, possibly intercept. So I guess talk to me about how you're kind of, you know, what your setups will like will typically look like, you know, like how you're picking your tree and, you know, are you looking for, you know, you know, especially in like the mountain kind of areas, are you looking for certain like multiple terrain features to kind of all come together at a certain spot that makes you feel really good about being just off that big sign or whatever the case is? I guess just talk to me about how you're kind of picking those spots within the spot. Well, uh, you know, you, you said it best right there, you know, multiple, uh, terrain features or, uh, habitat edges that the more of those type of spots that you come in that have coming into one place, mm-hmm. the better, of course, cause you're going to, you know, that just, uh, a- every terrain feature that you have, uh, multiplies your chances of, uh, a good deer coming through there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in, in places like that, 
bucks are more likely to come through. But, you know, like just single, like a saddle mm-hmm. or a bench or something other like that, you know, single type uh, terrain features, bucks tend to uh, skirt around the outer edge of mm-hmm. it. You know, yep. uh, I, I really like hunting uh, secondary ridges. I spend most of my time hunting secondary ridges, but I don't hunt right on top of the ridge. You know, I'm mm-hmm. I'm almost always off one side or the other, mm-hmm. you know, and generally I'm, you know, on the leeward side. Yep. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that kind of accomplishes two things there, you know, uh, that puts you downwind and just so happens that puts the buck downwind of uh, the the same area that you're hunting, you know, so. If you're right. playing the wind, then you're most likely putting yourself in position uh, for an encounter with the buck anyway. Right. But, you know, uh, I was kind of looking at my um, uh, Onyx the other day because I'm all the time getting people send me uh, topo maps, mm-hmm. you know, asking me to kind of help them, you know, decide on places, you know, and the most obvious places you know, that you, uh, are going to be, um, you know, saddles or any terrain feature that pops out on, uh, you know, your on X or topo map. Mm -hmm. But I have found that most of my spots are not in those spots. You know, they're more in the micro terrain features, you know, uh, that you can't see on a topo map, you know, or, um, satellite imagery, you know, in in the mountains that is, you know, right especially whenever it comes to, uh, satellite imagery. But, um, you know, I, you know, I'm just always off to one side or the other of any terrain feature, or, you know, I'm down under the top of the ridge, uh, along the edge of, a, you know, if it's rhododendron, I'm usually, you know, hunting the edge of that. If it's a uh, mountain laurel, I'm usually back in it, you know, a little ways. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there's, n- there's not really a specific thing that I say that I focus on. Other than, you know, if it's a bench, I'm going to be either below the bench or above the bench. I'm going to be hunting right on the bench. Right. You know, on either end of that bench is usually good because, you know, everything kind of converges, you know. Uh, you know, even though a buck, you know, most of the time they'll go around the below the lip of the bench, you know, but by the time they get out toward the end of it, you know, the, the trail that goes across the bench as well as his trail is going to be at the closest point. Right. At the, you know, uh, so that's how I go about, you know, uh, deciding on where I want to hunt. And of course, you know, it surprises me how many people go up, a a electric pole straight tree, you know, (laughs) with no cover on it, you know, and you'll, you'll have two guys up those one, a cameraman and one's the hunter, you know, and they stick out like a sore thumb. So, you know, I'm always looking for trees that give me plenty of cover. You know, that's, I think that's where a lot of hunters fail. You know, they, yeah, they they just don't choose a tree that gives them sufficient cover, you know. Yeah, no, I, I man, I hear you there. It's you know, I always kind of say it's like I'll prioritize cover over shot opportunities because I'll try to pick the right spot to where I can get the shot opportunity I think I'm going to need, and I'll I'll ra- I'd rather oh, yeah. I'd rather live to live to hunt another day with that particular deer or, or whatever the case is than be be hung out the dry, you know. Oh um, yeah. I have stood in one spot for 30 minutes trying to figure out which trees I wanted to go up because that perfect tree wasn't there, you know, right. but in a situation like that, you have to make do with what you have because if it's yep. the right spot, you know, if it's a tree that doesn't have a lot of cover, by all means, get on the back side of that tree, you know, yep. and, uh, uh, you know, and face the tree, uh, you know, the deer be approaching from behind the tree, you know, yep. so, yep. Use what little bit of cover you can to your advantage. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that you say you you'll sometimes stand in a spot for 30 minutes trying to pick out a tree because I don't feel alone now because I thought maybe I was the only. Oh yeah. <laughs> the guy Even who trail camera in. placement, I'll do the same thing. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. It's uh it, it's funny because I'll maybe stress out over that more than I do like picking a doctor. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I'll stand there and contemplate for an hour where I'm going to hang this trail camera and I'll pick a doctor just by going on like the insurance program. We're like, yeah, that's the closest one to the house. Let's choose that one. You know, it's like, it yep. takes me a little time to get there. But, uh, I mean, I'm glad you brought up, you know, benches. Um, cause I was actually going to go there next. Cause that's the one thing that I've noticed in some of these bigger pieces that I've hunted that I've actually found where deer will spend more time. Um, 
yeah. what what I've noticed is like, especially in country that has like whether it's West Virginia or whatever the case is, where there's spine backs and stuff like that. Like I feel like the tops of those, there'll be a lot of sign laid down there. But I've you know have have had cameras in those places and stuff like that. And like the deer you'll see through there is mainly at night, and that signs being tended tended at at night. And it'll a lot of times be be does. Where I've seemed to got had the best probably camera intel and and, and so forth has pr- has typically been on benches and it's been kind of like those secondary terrain features so, to a degree and I'm glad you brought up that they'll skirt like those singular kind of um, terrain features like a like a big saddle or whatever the case is because there's I'll give you an example there was one spot that had that, a really killer saddle and a hammer scrape in it camera on it and deer rarely showed up to it right all around it though on the benches that were kind of surrounding it all kinds of activity right and and it was just interesting to me because you know so much of the sign was like in those terrain features but it just wasn't being traveled through quite so frequently like do you have a rhyme or reason why they why they like that is it is it the the ability to use that and be able to work, you know, thermals during different times of the day? Or what what do you think that causes them to use that those bench systems so much? Or do you think because those bench systems in, in big time ridge country really do start to tie all these ridges together? Um, I think all of the above, you know, yeah. uh, pretty much everything that you just mentioned, you know. Um I do think that thermals and prevailing wind direction can uh, play into it. But I think that it's mostly, you know, right back to that refrigerator uh, uh, example that I give you, you know, that's a a specific spot. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you hear all your life that deer like to use the path of least resistance. You know, Mm -hmm. that that is not 100% true. You know, um, uh, these older age class bucks, man, that they would do things that you never dreamed that they would do. I, I was hunting a, uh, a, a really big deer in Southern West Virginia, you know, and I was hunting a bench, you know, it was a strip bench. It, it, it had grown up nice and thick. You would think that, you know, uh, those big deer would cruise those benches, you know, but you'll see, uh, you know, two and three year olds on it. And, and of course those and stuff like that. But those older bucks, man, they'll be down under the bench or above the bench. Mm-hmm. And but now, so they they will cross them. But now, they don't always cross in what you would consider the easiest spot. I've seen them cross, and they would be a trail. And, and this is a place that he's very familiar with, so it's not like that he came through there and uh, didn't know that trail was there. But he would not take the heavy trail. You know, mm-hmm. he would go up through the nastiest spot ever was. And you would be set up thinking that he would come through the easy spot and he won't do it. Right. Um, and there was another example in Ohio. I was hunting a uh, kind of like a river bluff type of area. And uh, there was a uh, um, a blowdown. You know, a tree had fell over. Well, the perfect tree grew right up in the middle of that uh, uh, um, tree that had blown over. And that's where I was at. And these bucks were working around the edge of that uh, um blow down or not blow down but uh that bluff well i had a, a really nice 10 come up and instead of going around the uh, uh blow down he goes right dead through the middle of it hmm. you know and so big deer really do odd things a lot of times right so you know yeah it's just they be, they become masters of their surroundings they do yeah you know it's uh I was just thinking as you were kind of talking about that deer doing different things. It's like, I know, you know, uh, we have a mutual buddy, Chad Sylvester. Yeah. I hunt a lot oh, yeah. with him. Yeah. And, uh, he was hunting this one particular deer and, and, and this just goes to kind of prove the point that you made. There's an area that has a really great bench. Um, you know, some good, you know, inventory in the general area. We knew a particular deer was spending a fair amount of time in here that he was hunting and stuff like that. And, he was setting up to try to kill this deer and he and I were both kind of, I mean, I would have put money on it that it, that deer was going to be dead early October. Like I, if I'm not a betting man, but if I were, <laughs> I would have put money on it that I was going to get a phone call. Um, and when he was hunting it and you know, he just, he wasn't seeing a lot of deer. And so he ended up moving a little bit, you know, 50, 60 yards down or whatever. And he was kind of hunting this bench system 
and he comes out the one night and we're talking and he's like, man, he's like, I saw the damnedest thing. I'm like, what's that? He's like, you know, that steep part of the ridge right there. He's like, you know, that goes, he's like where that one bed was at that we found. He's like, you know, it goes straight up over. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, I saw bucks walk up over that, the steepest part of the whole thing. That would be the hardest part to walk through. He's like, never in my life would I thought that deer would just willingly go up across that, you know? And yeah. it just kind of went to show that like, you know, the plan that he had was good with the exception of like those deer were not following a script, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. they were, they weren't taking the path of least resistance and, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, people get comfortable with that path of least resistance, resistance kind of idea if they're hunting in areas that have a lot of structure, right? Because they're going to yeah. have like these certain ways that they're going to, it's going to funnel deer and they're going to move deer, whether it's a lot of structure just through like a bunch of just converging and changing terrain features rapidly, or whether it's in farm country where you've got breakup or, you know, from ag fields or timber cuts where you have like all kinds of structure. Cause I mean, you can get into some big woods places where if they've done enough cuts in one particular area, it almost hunts like farm country. You know, because of all the structure yeah. and the food, this food's kind of, you know, centrally located or whatever the case is. But in some of these big wood settings where you don't have that structure, man, those defined lines of movement aren't as defined as we would, as we would hope, I guess is maybe one way to say it. Right. And it sounds That's like you can exactly experience right. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and if it's, if it's too easy, uh, they'll avoid it. And I'll give you an example of just this past fall. I was hunting a ridge that had a uh, um, a fence that come across the ridge. Now, this, this is private property here. This is where I work. Mm -hmm. And there is a gate dead top of that ridge that's open. And uh, there's a scrape line that comes out, a logging road that comes through there. And I seen several bucks, and I and I knew in my gut that I was not in the right spot. Because, but I chose that there was uh, actually a couple train features come in together that aligned with that gate. Mm -hmm. Common sense would tell you that any deer that came through there would use that open gate. Mm -hmm. Well, every deer except for the big bucks come through that gate <laughs> you know the big bucks they would come toward that gate right. and work us uh, uh, and i watched one work a scrape not too far from it and then instead of walk uh, coming through the gate he went down off the steep side of the hill jumped the fence and then went right on around the side of the hill <laughs> you know yeah. so that that that's just a good example of uh, you know hunting differently you know you have to hunt differently to have good encounters or you know a lot of guys will see those bucks but they're not set up to kill them right you know you have to set up differently for whenever that encounter happens you have to kill him right then yeah yeah and that's i, I think that's something consistent with you know the amount of years i've been doing this podcast of just like hearing guys like yourself you know that are you know just that that get it done on a regular basis on really mature deer um there's a big difference between seeing them and killing them you know, and they, yeah. and, and they don't make very many mistakes and what seems like very random to us is not random, random at all for them, you that's know? Right. And, yeah. um, and I think that's the hardest part to kind of wrap your mind around. I think at least for me as a, as an evolving bow hunter, maybe is one way to say it, you know, at least in my life, there's been kind of uh seminal kind of light bulb moments for me that where. I won't say things got easier, but things made more sense. And I started having right, better yeah. encounters. Right. Um, one of the biggest things for me was, was finally whenever the light bulb went off where I understood how to like play and work with wind and thermals without having to think about it so much, you know what I mean? Where I could yeah. just kind of get into a spot, look at the map and look at the terrain and be like, all right, well, this is probably what's going to happen. What time of day is it? All right. This is what my prevailing is. This is probably what the wind's going to do. And I could set up for it, you know what I mean? And give the deer the yeah. wind a little bit. You know, now I know mountain country where you're at, and I'd love to hear you talk about this a little bit, but that's probably some of the least predictable wind I've ever hunted in, <laughs> in those, in those, uh, in those setups. But to me, it's like, I think the part that I'm trying to get better at and how I see like maybe my next evolution is, you know, um, uh, taking the path less traveled for my setups. Um, 
and maybe trusting my gut a little bit more and doing some of the, what would seem like us to be unconventional. Right. But it's really not in the deer's eyes. Right. And starting to get yeah. there, there more quickly. Cause hearing you talk about it, I'm like, Oh yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. But in the moment I don't, it, it doesn't, I don't get there that quickly. And it sounds like you and guys like you, it's like you get into a spot and you kind of get there mentally, like, and it just happens. Like you just get it immediately. Is that kind of, yeah. does that sound right? Where it's almost like a sixth sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just something that you, it, and, and you can't teach that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you can tell people about it, but you can't teach how to see that, mm-hmm. you know, and <clears throat> back to, you know, how bucks use the, you know, come through these terrain features or, or areas differently. The ideal situation is whenever you find uh, a spot where you have high deer activity and uh, uh, where these bucks like to cruise or travel through differently, cross those type of areas. Mm-hmm. You know, th- then you can have your cake and eat it too. You right. know, it, it, if you can get what I'm saying. And, and actually, that's, that, that to me, that's the perfect setup because you have plenty of deer activity and you're setting yourself up to where, um, you know, you, you can have an encounter uh, with a buck and be able to kill him too. Right. And, and really and truly, you know, I can spend, and, and you know where I'm talking about, I can spend all day walking the woods uh, up there and go through a hundred really good looking spots. But out of those, all those spots, I'll pick one or two of them. Right. Because they have, it, you know, ha- they have that characteristic, you know. Right. Right. I'm curious, man, just like, this is almost a personal, you know, question, you know, well, I think it'd be helpful for folks listening too, because I think sometimes, you know, I, I've always said, and like, and again, this is another thing that helped me as I was like evolving as a bow hunter was when I stopped being interested in seeing deer and started being more interested in, uh, killing deer and seeing the right deer. Um, yeah. you know, so I guess how often, like how many sits will you potentially go and not see a deer? Uh, well, I mean, it happens a lot, mm-hmm. you know, but, uh, like I said, that's hard to answer, you know, really and truly because, you know, it depends on the deer density in the area and, mm-hmm. you know, if I, I'm seeing, you know, it, I don't know that there's a whole lot of things that play in there. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm seeing deer a little bit, you know, maybe there's a fresh, you know, but maybe there's a scrape and it's, it's still being hit. You know, even though I'm not seeing deer, so I know I know that he's still there. Uh, I just need to make an adjustment to be able to to see him. You know, um, I don't know that that's that's really hard to answer. No, that, that, no, you, that's so. yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, it's all. I mean, so much of this stuff is contextual too, right? It's like where you're yeah. at, what time of year it is, you know, it, what the deer density is, what you know, you like. There's so many things that kind of yeah. kind of go into it. You know, I know for me in some spots. Yeah. You know, I might go three or four days and not see proof of life, you know what I mean? And that to me in some areas that I hunt, like that's normal, you know, it's like not for the places that I'm set up. It's like, I'm not going to see a deer, but maybe once every three to four hunts, five hunts possibly. But if I do, there's a real good chance it's the right one, you know, and that, that I think is something that, you know, people have a hard time grasping or coming to terms with, because I mean, look, I don't like sitting all day. (laughs) <laughs> for five days and see a deer, you know what I mean? Like nobody does, but, right. um, but sometimes that's what it takes in some of those places because that's just the, the card you're dealt with the area, you know? Um, that's right. Yeah. You know, and, um, and you, uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, go I ahead. just want to say, you know, like October, you know, if I haven't seen what I want to kill within one or two sits, I'm moving. Yep. Uh, during, uh, you know, first part of November, you know, hopefully, you know, I, I feel like if I'm seeing some deer, then I know that I'm in the right spot. Mm-hmm. C- getting into late November, first part of uh, December, you know, uh, I'm going to hunt uh, areas that uh, are really good funnels, catching bucks. Uh, you know, I may hunt there several times, but I know if I spend enough time there, I'm eventually going to catch a good one coming through there. So, right. you know, m- maybe that might help break down, you know, as far as from the front of the season through the back of the season, no, that's, uh, it, what I'm willing to see and, and, you know, 
go him you know how many days i'll go without seeing some other so yeah no totally make makes sense so i'm curious especially in like the big wood setting you know you know knowing that you know maybe a day or two depending on time time of year and stuff like that and especially if you know we get close to that rut time period and they're moving if you have a good terrain feature that you're working that you're seeing movement then like it's you know maybe it's a little longer um yeah you know how many days you know um I'm going to ask it this way. Do you think people give up on a spot too quick in the mountains or in the big woods where you have maybe low deer densities, like, and they, you know, uh, where they think they've burnt the Absolutely. spot? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because it, you know, access and um, having your stand in the right spot for the moment, you know, it, if you can get in and out of the spot without spooking deer, if you can hunt that spot without spooking deer, then there's no reason that you can't hunt that spot for multiple days. And that is what uh, is really required for consistent success in the mountains. You know, right. you've got to be able to hunt really good spots for several days in a row to expect success. Right. So how do you balance, like, aggressiveness with that patience, right? Because it sounds to me like when you know there's a deer in an area, right. Or if you have that feeling like you have no problem moving in and pressing the envelope, it sounds like, and trying to get into his business to get an opportunity. But it also sounds at the same time that you recognize that patience is going to be key in this area just by the low deer density and you know, their how much room they have to cover and travel. Like, so how are you kind of, you know, balancing that, that aggressive approach with like that, with the patience on the back end of it almost. Uh, well, I don't really know how to answer that either, but, um, uh, you know, my setups are generally, I'm always closer to bedding than I am food. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I know that if I spend enough time there that he's eventually going to be there mm -hmm. and I have a good idea of which direction he's going to be moving. So, you know, I just spend, and I have a handful of spots like that, and I just kind of rotate through those depending on wind direction and, you know, stuff like that. So I just know if I spend enough time there that I'm eventually going to catch him coming through there. Right, right. So um, some spots I'll hunt, for, be able to hunt multiple days in a row if the wind is right, and if it's not, then I don't hunt it, you know. So that has a lot to do with how much time I'll spend in the spot, too. Right, right. And I got to imagine too, man, the, the, uh, the, the, the I, I don't know the area that you particularly hunt in, in, in Virginia. I've never been there. I'd love to get down there at some point, but it, I'd imagine you have some pretty brutal kind of wind and, and thermal conditions to kind of deal with just by the, the elevation that you're kind of, kind of working in. Does it, does it play havoc kind of more on you than, than maybe some other areas that you've hunted in, in your life? Uh, no, not really. I mean, no. I've, I've hunted Ohio, uh, at times and, and the wind never cooperated. You could not ever depend <laughs> on it to do anything. Yeah. And that's very stressful. And, and you deal with the same thing here in the mountains. And sometimes you have perfect conditions, you know, it does exactly what it's supposed to. So, you know, so sometimes, you know, you'll get to where you're wanting to go before daylight and you have to abandon what you're uh, uh, doing. You know, mm -hmm. you have to go you know, couldn't and do something completely different, even if it's hunting off the ground, you know, but now in recent years, I have been hanging more than one stand in, in any one location. Hmm. That way I'm able to, you know, uh, spend more time there depending on, you know, the wind direction, you know, if it changes on me, then I can get down and move to the other stand, you know, right. So that's one thing that I do to be able to do that. So, right. So you're able now, to... as... go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that, uh, you know, as far as, you know, access is more important than, than uh, I think a lot of people uh, give it credit for too, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, you know, accessing from the bottom versus from the top, you know, in the mountains during the mornings, you are much better uh, accessing from the bottom mm -hmm. uh, because of thermals, you know, you, you have a really good uh, a draft coming down off that mountain because of the, the cooling air. And if you, if you're hunting a secondary ridge, like over on the north side, like that's what I do most of the time. If you come from the south side of that mountain and as soon as you cross over, if you are in the drainage that you are hunting, you know, or above the drainage that you're hunting, you 
you just screwed yourself big time for the rest of that day. Game over. Because yeah. every deer, you game over. Every deer that is in that drainage at that moment, and I, I'm talking seconds, know that you're there. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, you know, dropping thermals in early mornings is something that you need to pay extreme amount of attention to, you know. Because right. generally, you know, during uh, November, you know, the wind generally isn't blowing that much uh, in pre-dawn. Right. Once, you know, the sun comes up, then the uh, wind starts moving on you, you know. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, ex- exactly. It's <clears throat> it's all those little details, you know, that kind of yeah. add, add up, right? That, you know, if you're not paying attention or if you're just not thinking about it, can can ruin an entire day. I want to go back to, you've mentioned secondary ridges a couple of times, and I just... I would love for you just for everyone out there listening to kind of describe what you mean by that. And if maybe describe what it looks like on a topo map. So people will understand like when they're looking for a secondary ridge, what it is they're looking, you know, that's going to potentially stick out to them. Well, you have a main ridge that will run a long distance, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in, in my area, most of our ridges run east to west mm-hmm. and, you know, that, that will be a major ridge. And then off both sides of those major ridges, you'll have these little uh, finger ridges that, that come off, you know, ever so often. And you'll have these drainages, of course, in between each one of those ridges. Mm-hmm. And that's the type of areas that I focus on is those secondary ridges. Yeah. And, you know, another great uh, uh, area that I like to, and, and generally, uh, most of the ri- uh, secondary ridges that I'm hunting are on the eastern end of those uh, main ridges because now mm-hmm. I found a lot of big deer love to uh, bed on the very end of those main ridges on the eastern uh, facing slope there hmm. you know you've got a lot of things work or they have a lot of things working for them then you know most of our wind comes out of the west so you know they've, mm-hmm. they've got that westerly wind coming across the top yep. the, the uh, sun rises in the east you know and that is the very first uh, uh, surface of the earth that the uh, uh, sun is you know starting to hit so you you start having, you know, not only is it, you know, on really cold days, you know, that's the first warm place that they're going to get, but that's the first place that you're going to get uh, any thermal, thermal activity, pool. you know, as yeah. far as thermals rising, you know. Yep. So uh, those are, you know, good spots to look for. Now, I can't guarantee that you'll always find a big deer there, but that's a good place to look, you know. So the eastern end of a ridge on a second on a secondary ridge is the is the spot is what it sounds like or at least a good well place to start. Uh, on secondary ridges yes uh, the eastern face is good but I'm talking about the very end of a main ridge Got where it, it drops off okay awesome yeah yeah the no, east that, end of it yeah no that makes sense and it's funny because. You know, if you just because it, it all makes logical sense, right? When you start talking about it, and you start putting the puzzle pieces together, and you start thinking about thinking how a deer thinks or what they should be thinking about, right? It's like you know, where's uh-huh. the best place to be? Like, what are the things that I need? I need to be able to work the wind, you know, or I need to be able to work a thermal in, in the morning or as early as I would like to or be able to, so I can make sure that I'm, you know, my, I'm 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 safe, you know, and you know, and they all and, and they kind of live and die by their nose, right? So it makes sense that those places, That's exactly if, right. if it's cold it's the first place to get warm. Yep. So it's, it's, you know, not only yep. do the thermal like a uh, pool work there, but the thermal uh, uh, cover or the thermal aspect of warmth kind of works from that perspective too, you know? So that's you, right. And if, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, uh, and also, you know, uh, that is going to be the, not, uh, not only the North side, but the uh, Eastern side will be uh one of the first places that starts uh, cooling off during the uh, day too, you know, because once the sun cut starts coming away from it, you know, see, it, it, it just works so perfectly for a buck, you know, mm-hmm. it, it starts warming up uh, the first place to start warming up, you know, the sun comes up uh, midday uh, when the temperatures uh, start warming up, then that's the, once the sun starts uh, heading west, then that area starts cooling off, you know, and uh so you know he's he's it, well he just works perfect to him I yeah. mean, th- th- there's no better scenario for a big deer than a east facing slope nice so i'm curious man like you've you've been hunting big mature deer for a long a long time and you know all the stuff that you've we've talked about during you know the session so far is just 
is, is spot on uh, and I think is is super helpful because you have years of experience of, of actually watching it play out, you know, and, and have firsthand experience. I'm always curious, you know, at least I'll, again, I'll use myself as an example as like a person who's continuing to evolve as a bow hunter. You know, as I'd mentioned, you know, earlier, like there's been like these seminal moments for me that where things really kind of like worked or they made sense or I didn't have to think about it any longer. And a lot of times for me, it's been like, maybe I didn't kill a whitetail, but I, but I had some really close encounters and got to spend some time with, with, you know, older deer, right. And watch how they work. And I'm curious from your perspective, you know, what are some lessons that have, that stand out in your mind that some of these deer that may, it might be the ones that you didn't kill that, that taught you something that really allowed you to kind of level up your game. Hunt steeper and thicker. Hunt steeper and thicker. That, that's, that's hunt steeper and thicker and stop hunting heavy signs. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how many times that I have set up and, and, and this is a lesson that I learned a long time ago, back in, back in the nineties, probably late nineties. Uh, you know, it's like hunting these secondary ridges, you know, uh, a lot of times you'll have secondary ridges that, that are fairly flat as they come out and then they make a nose dive and, and, you know, off into like a Creek drainage or something like that. Mm -hmm. And up on these, uh, up on top of the secondary ridges or even the main ridge, you'll have these big flats, you know, Mm -hmm. and there's always big sign on those big flats and you would always hunt those type of spots and you would never see the buck that was creating those. And so I started creeping over the edge, you know, and hunting to where I could see off the side as well as up on the uh, top, you know, mm-hmm. and I started seeing the, those very bucks down off of those, uh, you know, steep, thick hillside. Hmm. And once I started uh, hunting down there, I started having more encounters with those deer, hmm. you know, um, so it just goes hand in hand with, you know, not hunting the heavy sign, hunting hmm. steeper and hunting thicker, you know. That right. doesn't mean that you have to step right up on the a steep hillsides. You know, look for some kind of terrain feature among, you know, around those hillsides or, uh, you know, to hunt or where those steep hillsides uh, uh, start coming up into the flatter type areas. You know, there uh, look for those terrain features, you know, uh, along that edge, you know, hunt those type of spots. So. Right, right. But, th- but don't always hunt right in the middle of it, you know hunt to one side of that train feature or the other. Right. And, and a lot of times you'll get in trouble by trying to split the difference, yeah. you know, make the decision, either hunt the, uh, in other words, don't, don't try to split the difference. Cause if you do, you, all you're going to do is see him mm-hmm. and that's all you're going to get to do. Right. Unless you can find those places where, uh, you know, you have the high deer traffic plus, uh, the, the zone or whatever you want to call it or the line where those big bucks like to cruise or travel crosses that type of spot. Then wherever you find that, then, you know, most times that's money, you know, but those, those spots are hard to find. Right. Awesome, man. (laughs) Well, man, I've kept you for about an hour and a half. I got one more question for you that I like to kind of close things with. Um, if, if, if you got time for one more, sound good. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, so this one's kind of a, a theoretical question, right? Um, my buddy Chad or buddy Chad asked me this one time on their podcast. Um, and I always just thought it was kind of an interesting way to kind of close things out and, um, always like to hear how, you know, people have been influenced in their, in their hunting journey. And, uh, so the question is like, uh, I don't know if you're a basketball fan or not, but we got the NCAA tournament going on now. Um, if you were building a, a basketball team for a three on three tournament, right? So we're going to have a three on three tournament basketball team made up of hunters that we're going to hunt, you know, whatever, whatever property. And the goal is to try to have the three best hunters you could possibly have that are going to fill tags on your team. Who would those people be and why? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that That's a good question. Um, and they don't have to be alive living. They don't have to be well known or whatever. I'm just always curious, you know, you know, it, I get some really interesting answers with this question. Well, mountain hunters, I don't know that that would be a really good question probably. And I don't know these guys, but, uh, 
I talked to Bo Martonic a lot. I think mm-hmm. that he, I would want him on my team. Um, and they don't have to be mountain hunters. They can just be hunters in general, deer hunters, oh, just in, general. hunters in general, yeah, deer, deer hunters uh, in general. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for Don Higgins. Mm-hmm. Uh, he kills a lot of big deer. Um, Andre DeQuisto, you know, he, he's, he's been a master for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and gosh, uh, Heath Cisco, you mm-hmm. know, uh, Justin Hollinsworth, those two guys get it done, you know, very consistently, you know, yeah. uh, they're right there with four, you know, yeah. um, and, and there's a, there's a lot of others, you know, so yeah. 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 It's interesting. I think my three, you know, it's, uh, I don't even know if I've said this on this, on this show, but my three would probably be, um, uh, Zach Farrenbaugh is, is, is one. I just like how he hunts super aggressive on the ground. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's fun watching what he does. And he's just, I'm like, he's, he's, he's part native American. I, I'm like, he's part Comanche or something. You know what I mean? It's like the way he, the way he does it. Um, and then, uh, the other one for me is, uh, Joe Rentmeester. Um, you know, he's kind yeah. of a, you know, buddy of, of Dan and faults. Like he's just one of those guys that just, if there's a deer in there, he has zero quit. He will find a way to kill that deer, you know? Right. Um, yeah. and the other one for me was, uh, Andy may, cause it just seems like, doesn't yeah. matter where you drop that guy off and a piece of timber somewhere. If there's a deer in there that's mature and he wants to kill it and he knows where roughly where it's at, it's days are pretty much numbered, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, well, cool, man. Uh, I appreciate you coming on before I let you get out of here. If you wouldn't mind, let people know where they can follow, uh, follow you, find out more about you and, uh, kind of follow along with your hunting excursions for the year. Well, just, uh, uh, my Instagram account, of course, you know, uh, mountain hunter M T N H U N R, I think is how it's spelled. I don't, I've got a Facebook, but I don't really do anything on there. So, <laughs> But that's about it. You know, uh, I, I am affiliated with the Stick Boys. Uh, they have a podcast, too, and a YouTube channel. And uh, uh, they're really good friends of mine. So, you know, uh, I am working on some scouting uh, YouTube videos with those guys. So, you know, that'd be a good place to kind of look for, you know, a little bit of content coming here pretty soon. So Awesome, man. I'll, I'll definitely be checking that out. So super interested in that. Yeah. But uh, awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on, buddy. I appreciate your time. Yeah, appreciate you, man. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there, too. I'd be super appreciative if you'd be able to do those two things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout-out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Skull Brew Coffee Company, and Maven Optics. And until next time, we'll see y'all.